Well, we want to welcome all of our VU friends and family, people who are joining us by way of YouTube and the podcast. Can we make some noise for all of our VU friends and family who are tuning in wherever you're at, wherever you're coming from? I want you to reach for your Bible and turn with me to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 30. Tonight we are continuing a collection of talks entitled Asking for a Friend. And the premise of the entire talk is really all about relationships. This collection is really talking about how we become better in our relationships. And what we believe, Don Shree and I, is that we believe that healthy relationships are made up out of healthy individuals. That's why week one of the collection, Don Shree took some time to preach to all of the men of the house. And then last week, I took some time to preach to all of the women of the house. But tonight, we're tag teaming this thing, and we're coming for everybody out there. Come on, make a little bit of noise if you're excited about God's Word. I have so loved this collection because I think that this conversation really should take place in church. I think that this is the place that we should talk about relationships. The Bible doesn't shy away from giving us wisdom and insight on our day-to-day relationships. And for all of us, our relationship is always... Um, safeguarded and filled with strength when it is on the foundation of Jesus Christ. You know, no matter how great your relationship is, I don't care how long you guys have been together, can I tell you, that relationship is dysfunctional if it's not on the foundation of Jesus because your relationship was created with the primary function of giving glory and honor to God. How many of you believe that today? That through your relationships, as we entrust them to God, that God can get glory. And so today we look to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 30, and we're gonna read today. It says in verse 15, C, I set before you today life and prosperity, death and destruction, for I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to Him, and to keep His commands, decrees, and laws. Then you will live and increase, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land you are entering to possess. But if your heart turns away and you're not obedient, and if you're drawn away to bow down to other gods and worship them, I declare to you this day that you will certainly be destroyed. You will not live long in the land you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. This day, I call the heavens and the earth as witnesses against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now, choose life so that you and your children may live and that you may love the Lord your God, listen to his voice and hold fast to him, for the Lord is your life, and he will give you many years in the land he swore to give to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And we wanna take the next few minutes to talk to you on this thought, four questions every couple should answer. We got questions. How many of you know that we are a product of our choices? Uh, The life you are living today is a direct result of the decisions you made yesterday. Uh, I've learned that the better decisions I make today, the less regrets I'm going to have tomorrow. Can I get an amen out there? (laughs) Our life is a sum total of all of the decisions and choices that we make. Therefore, we must learn how to make good decisions, healthy decisions. Sometimes in the category of relationships and love, you ever notice that we tend to make impulsive decisions? We tend to make emotional decisions. We tend to make decisions out of infatuation. Uh, I meet so many people and they fall in love and it's like, oh, they just give me butterflies. I'm all for butterflies, but you better know butterflies fly away. (laughs) You're gonna have to actually make an intellectual decision. You're gonna actually have to make a decision that's backed with commitment, backed with calculation. You're gonna have to learn how to choose right. You know, February is always a fun month for Don Shree and I because uh, we actually met in February of 2002, meaning this month we celebrate 18 years of dating, y'all. And some of y'all are like, dating? Aren't you guys married? Yeah, we're married, but we still date. If you don't date your spouse, somebody else will. (laughs) Keep dating. Um, It keeps it fresh. Uh, But 13 years ago, in the month of August, we celebrated 13 years of marriage. And so now we are really in our 13th year, and we're so thankful. And I go back to that day that I said, I do at the altar. And that was a huge decision that I made. As I said, till death do us part, for richer or for poor, hopefully for richer, but even if you are poor, I'll stay with you. Um, (laughs) 
And as I made that decision, how many know that was powerful then, but really the power is the fact that I'm, I made a decision today. I'm making a decision already for tomorrow. Relationships are powerful because we have to make healthy ones. When I married Don Cherie, I didn't know it, but when I married Don Cherie, I wasn't just marrying Don Cherie, but I was marrying an entire family. I didn't know I was gonna get the entire Duron clan to come with her. Oh, well, come on. Raging Cajun, baby. That's what you are now. That's true, y'all. Um, anyways, <laughs> we gotta learn how to make right decisions. And Tonight, the text that we're looking at comes from Deuteronomy chapter 30. And this is really the third speech that Moses has given to the Israelites. And in this third speech, he's going through different commands and different ways to worship God. But he's ending his speech. And I just love it. It's so eloquent. He says, see, I set before you today life and death, blessings and curses. Moses is like that teacher you loved in high school that you would turn your test in. It was a true or false test. And you circled false and they go, the answer is true. Moses gives us the right answer. He says, choose life. Now, when Moses says choose life, he's not simply talking about existence. He's not talking about like life and death just simply from a mortal standpoint. He's talking about something even deeper than that. He's challenging you and I that we would put God first in every decision that we make, that we would choose God's plan over our plan. And when we choose God's plan over our plan, it's going to lead not to death, but rather it's going to lead to life and life more abundantly. Come on, somebody, make a little bit of noise if tonight you wanna learn how to choose life. Tonight, we wanna give you four questions that every couple must answer. And I wanna give you the answer, choose life. And tonight, if you don't know what the answer that life is, we're gonna tell you. (laughs) choose life, you got to answer these questions. So we have four questions tonight. And the first question is, will you choose to listen before you speak? Great. Come on, this question. Yeah, amen. Talk about it. You can bless. Share it. Share it. This is a question for all of us. I don't care what the status is of your relationship. This is a question for you. And I'm not asking, will you choose to listen instead of speaking? I'm asking you, will you choose to listen before you speak? Meaning that communication has a proper order. And the right order is that we listen before we speak. You know, there's differences in the way that we communicate. And and it would be too simple for me to just boil it down to him being a man and me being a woman. No, it's much deeper than that. We actually have different personalities. And we could go around this room and some of you, you would have similar personalities to me. And some of you in this room would have similar personalities to Rich, but our difference in personality is what poses the challenge when it comes to this word communication. That how many of you know relationships are all about communication? Like it's not just one part of your relationship. Communication spans every single facet of your relationship. You gotta learn to communicate. And so what do you do, babe, when you have differences? (laughs) You you listen. (laughs) You know, Rich and I, we have different personalities. There's so many ways that we communicate that's completely different. Like Rich could be around people 100% of every moment of every second of his life. And he would be so enthused. That's an exaggeration. It's an exaggeration? Yes. Okay, what, what would be, be honest. It's what not a, it's would not be the percentage? It'd be more like 98% of the time. Like 98% of the time, you are enthused and re-energized by people. Sorry, correct? I like people. <laughs> I have to get. Someone's got to pastor this church. We're dividing the crowd. Team DC. I'm not even going to go there because I'm not even going to say it because my pride would be destroyed. We rolled together. That was all ladies. Where's all guys? Uh It's weak. It's weak. It's weak. It's weak. It's weak. weak. Keep going. We're different. Like just in our communication preferences, right? Rich loves audio books. I love to read paper books. Rich loves to study and work with music. He's inspired by music. He's, he, he, he creates to music. I have to have it completely silent 
for me to be able to focus and for me to be able to do my work. These are just a couple of the differences in our personalities. And how many of you know that it takes time, effort, and energy to learn about the person that you walk alongside? And that it would be very easy to go, oh, those differences are what make it difficult for us to walk this journey. But friends, those differences are actually what makes it exciting to walk alongside the person you love. It's an adventure to walk with Rich. He's different from me. He sees life from a different perspective. I don't wanna see things the same. I want somebody else to show me what they see in life and bring more color into life and bring more creativity and a different viewpoint. Are you with me tonight? We gotta love the differences. But let me ask you this. How do you know the differences unless you listen? How can you actually value what your partner brings to the table unless you ask questions and learn who they are? You see, when you listen, you learn. And when you make the decision to make conversation based upon what you already know about the person, well, you're choosing to walk forward uneducated about where you're going. Because it's the questions that you ask that will allow you to know them like you didn't know them before. I'm not the same person I was 17, 18 years ago when we fell in love. I'm a completely different person. Rich isn't the same person and it would be a mistake and it would be a tragedy for me to make a decision and an assumption on his life when I don't know what he's thinking right now. I've gotta ask questions and discover it for myself but we still just rely on what we already know. Friend, it's far more exciting in life to listen than to make declarations. It's far more exciting to ask questions than to be so proud and bold about what you already know. This is where the beauty in our relationship comes from. It comes from listening. So what is the solution if you're having a hard time in your communication? I would tell you the solution is to stop assuming. Can we be real? So many of life's misunderstandings, so many of the arguments, so many of the misjoy and thrill of relationship is when we just assume. We assume that, you know, that the person we love is in the same season they were in last year. We assume that their preferences are the same this year as they were seven years ago. We assume that they're exactly the same. No, friend, they're growing. And if you're not growing, you're dying. Thank God we're changing. Thank God we're learning. Thank God we're moving forward. So stop assuming. Proverbs 18, verse two, which was written by the wisest man to ever live, King Solomon, he says it like this. He says, a fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing his opinion. See, you have to learn. You have to learn to listen in order to move forward in unity with the person that you love. Communication. Communication is a powerful vehicle. Communication is the bridge between chaos and clarity. You can be in a season that you've never been in before. You can misunderstand your spouse. You can have confusion, you can have distinction, there can be unrest in your home, and you choose to ask and to listen. You choose to communicate. You choose to lean in instead of lean back. And as you choose to learn what that person is thinking, feeling, and seeing in this season, all of a sudden the chaos goes to clarity. All of a sudden you're able to see the same thing. You're able to run towards the same thing. And isn't that what we're all after in life? Oh, friend. What you're looking for is communication. The answer to your issues is choosing to learn to listen before you speak. And oftentimes, we relegate this to like just when we're in arguments, just when we're in fights. We're like, okay, that's when I need to learn to listen before I speak. But in every single area of your relationship, you gotta learn to listen before you speak. 
Like listening is an art form that will create more love and affection for that person that you're walking through life alongside. You gotta learn to listen about how they want to raise their kids, about how they view their future, about the dreams in their heart, about the things that they're inspired by, about their experience growing up, about the struggles in their life, about the real questions that they are facing. These are just a few of the things that you've gotta learn to discuss and learn to discover about the person that you love. And if you're looking for a tip on how to stop assuming and learn to listen, I just got one tip for you tonight. Put your phone down. Can I get an amen? Because I am guilty of this. I think that I would be able to communicate and listen so much clearer if I would choose to put my phone down quicker in conversations. Rich and I used to be on the phone a lot, but it was actually a good thing. My favorite thing in our dating relationship was the first year and a half when we were long distance because it actually forced us to talk. It I gotta made say, us I gotta say, it wasn't my favorite thing. I see the purpose in it now. <laughs> but that was like before. It's actually awesome because like yeah, you could do your right, thing, I could do mine, and then we would talk. Right? Well, I just. Like these kids that like I got. You d- I got to watch rom-coms. I got to do what I wanted. I got to eat where I wanted to. But then I still got to tell you that I loved you. Can I, can I say something? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> no, it's just like, I feel like today, like kids got FaceTime and stuff. That like takes away all the pain, you know? Like we used to like sit there and struggle and used to like sing me to sleep. She used to, she used to sing me Brian McKnight back at one. <laughs> You gonna sing it? Fun, you're like a dream come true to just wanna be with you three. Boy, it's plain to see that you're the only one for me. And four repeat steps on one through three, five, make you fall in love with me. If ever I believe my work is done then I start back at one that's it right there that's when I fell in love I used to sing to you baby Communi- listen listen but the thing I loved about the long distance is that it forced us to talk And it's so easy to just choose to go to the movies. And friend, I'm not against going to the movies. Just make sure that as you sit at the movies and you watch and you laugh at what the person's saying on the screen and you share your popcorn, that you're actually learning who the person sitting next to you really is. What they love, what they think, what their dreams are. Come on, is anybody with me? Communication is the vehicle from chaos to clarity. We have to ask ourselves these questions. It's beautiful. Second question that you need to answer tonight, if you're in a relationship, want to be in a relationship, is will you choose God's design for sex over your own distortion? All right. Um, You know, you can't talk about relationships and not talk about sex. And um, it's amazing because even this topic, even in church today in 2020 has become so polarizing because everybody in 2020 has their own definition or their own truth around sex. And my intent tonight is not to offend or to judge and make people feel bad. However, if you're a follower of Jesus and you believe in God's word, well, then it is your responsibility to talk to the designer about the design. In this case, God designed sex, meaning he has a whole lot to say about it. Sex is not dirty. Sex is not bad. Sex is a gift from God. Can I get an amen out there? Somebody bought our friend tonight. They're like, this is such a weird church, man. (laughs) Listen to me. When you misuse the gift, all of a sudden that which is meant to be helpful can become very, very hurtful. See, every gift that God gives us, you'll see this all throughout his word, every gift that God will ever give you is always attached to a boundary. The Bible is full of boundaries, yet the more you get to know God, what you discover is that God's boundaries are not a burden, they're actually a blessing. 
A, a great way to look at the boundaries of God is to consider guardrails on the freeway. Now, my guess is, is none of you have ever gotten to your car before and started driving on I-95 and said, this is crazy. Why do they have these guardrails on the highway? Can't stand it. No, you're actually thankful for the guardrail because the guardrail, it protects you from oncoming traffic and the guardrail keeps you from going off of the road. This is how God's word operates in the life of, of a believer. God's word protects you and God's word keeps you from walking on the path of life and life more abundantly. It's just how it works. And so God designed sex, and according to God's word, God's design for sex is in the confines of a marriage. So you can definitely have sex outside of marriage, but it's sort of like driving your car without guardrails. You can do it, but it's dangerous. You know, in the very, very beginning, Adam and Eve, we talked about that story last week, but it's a beautiful story because Adam and Eve, the first couple in the Bible, are given a beautiful gift. The gift was known as the Garden of Eden. Theologians and scholars refer to the Garden of Eden as a heaven on earth. It was a picture of paradise. It was a utopia. Everything in it, God declared, was good, even Adam and even Eve. However, God, whenever he gives a gift, always attaches it to a boundary. There was a boundary. There was a tree in the garden. The tree was the tree of the, of the good of knowledge, knowledge of good and evil. And God said, don't eat from the fruit from that tree. But yet, you know the story. One day, Eve is walking by, and the serpent, also known as the devil, begins to tempt her. And what does the devil say to her? I want you to notice this. The devil says to Eve, did God really say not to eat from this tree? See, the devil will always try to deceive you by getting you to question God's word. That's what's happening in culture today. Hold on, guys. Let's have a discussion. Did God really mean that? I mean, I've studied this in the Greek and the Hebrew, and uh, after looking at it, I think it's kind of gray. Really? It's how the enemy works. He just wants to get you to question God, but he doesn't stop there. What does the enemy say to Eve? He says, the reason why God doesn't want you to eat this fruit is because God knows if you eat this fruit, you'll become like God. What does he do? He doesn't just get us to question God's word. He now wants to get us to question God's motivation and intention towards our lives. God's not really actually for you. God's actually judging you and holding you back and limiting you. He doesn't want you to be completely who you want to be. What happens over and over again is that we buy into the lie of the enemy. What does Eve do? She eats the fruit, then Adam walks up, he eats the fruit, and right away, as soon as they break the boundary, what do they notice? They notice that they're naked for the first time. And because of their nakedness, they feel shame and they feel guilt. And what do they do? They run and they hide from God. This is a picture of humanity ever since that moment that so many of us are walking in shame. We're running and we're hiding from God. I don't know about you, but I'm thankful for a God that even in the very first book of the Bible gives us a picture of his grace and his mercy because he doesn't leave Adam and Eve in hiding. He goes looking for Adam and Eve. Oh, come on, I need you to make some noise tonight if you're thankful for a God who came and found you, a God who came searching for you. God shows up, he's like, Adam, where are you? Adam's not very smart, he's like, we're hiding. Men. <laughs> God says, Adam, what, why are you hiding? He says, because we, we ate the fruit. And he said, why did you do that? And he goes, well, Eve made me do it. <laughs> he says, Eve, why'd you do it? And she goes, the serpent made me do it. And it's a picture of us from the very beginning playing the blame game, shifting responsibility onto somebody else. The consequence for breaking the boundary is that they were kicked out of Eden. Now, before you go, oh, man, God is really rough. He's very, very judgmental, and I don't understand. Like, that's really hardcore for God to do that. You don't understand the context. The reason why they were kicked out of the Garden of Eden is because everything in Eden was perfect. But now, Adam and Eve no longer were. They had eaten from the tree, and they had now become aware of good and evil before they were perfect, walking with God in relationship God said, there's one boundary. It is a guardrail. And now because you've broken the guardrail, you are no longer protected and you are no longer kept in paradise. 
See, you, you got to get this in your heart tonight. Jesus, New Testament now, John chapter 8, verse 44, he speaks about the devil, that serpent in the garden. And what he says about the devil, he says, the devil is the father of lies. So you got to understand that the devil's native tongue is lying. The devil doesn't speak Spanish. <laughs> the devil doesn't speak English. He knows one language, and that is to lie. All he does is spew lies. He lies to you. He lies before, he lies in the middle, and he lies on the back end. And we are living in a world today that the devil is hijacking the narrative of sex. Understand, the enemy is not a creator of nothing. He has designed nothing. He only destroys, he only manipulates, he only perverts, he only destroys that which God created beautiful. So the devil's lying to people, bro. I meet so many single people in church like, all right, that's it, man. I wanna follow God, I'm gonna trust God. And so you know single godly people in church, they're easy to spot because they're just like, they're, uh, they're holding it in, you know? <laughs> uh, I'm just, and the devil starts lying to you and he tries to get you to crave sex. And so, oh, I'm craving it, man. <laughs> yeah, bro, these cold showers are not working, bro. <laughs> I, am, I am boiling with passion. Bro, you're boiling with something. I'm not sure if it's passion. And, and he, 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 he makes us think, I gotta have it, I gotta have it, I gotta have it. And what happens is we finally give in to the temptation. And what does he do? He lies to you before it. It's not a big deal. And then as soon as you do it, he lies to you after. That was the biggest deal you've ever made. That was the greatest mistake of your life. That's who you are now. And both are a lie. This is how he operates with pornography. So many of you, I've gotten to chat with you and hear your stories, and so many people in 2020 addicted to pornography. And this is not a house of shame or condemnation, but man, pornography is simply you taking from somebody, you using people as an instrument for your pleasure. You don't know their story. You don't know their background. You don't know how they got there. You're just feeding your eyes, watching them broken people, and you're trying to fill a broken area of your life, and it's never going to satisfy. But the enemy, he comes and he lies to you. He gets you to question God's word. He gets you to question God's intentions. He says, you gotta have it. You need it. You gotta have it. You need it. And you finally, you give in and you get a release. And as soon as you have the release, I've talked to so many of you, what happens? It's like you actually hate yourself more now than you did before. And he says, you're dirty. And he says, you're gross. And he makes you go into hiding and he makes you try to cover up and he makes you try to live quiet. Both are a lie. Culture would try to tell you and I that sex is simply physical. Oh, friend, it's physical, but I'm here to tell you it's not just physical. It's spiritual. It's emotional. There's something more to it. It's on a soul level. Culture would try to tell you if it feels good, do it. That's not a good model to live by. If you live with that model, you're going to end up in jail. Because somebody cut me off on 95 yesterday, and I felt like doing some stuff. <laughs> Culture wants to tell you that your identity is defined by your desire. Culture wants to tell you that any desire, any urge, any feeling, any mistake, any issue, that's who you are. Oh, but friend, I got better news for you than that. My Bible tells me that I've been born again. I got a brand new identity. My identity comes from Jesus. I'm not my mistake. I'm not my issue. I'm not my temptation. I'm not even my sexuality. I am a child of God, bought by the price of the lamb. I got a feeling tonight somebody's going to get set free. Somebody give God some praise. Whom the sun sets free is free indeed. Quit letting culture tell you who you are. You are not your desire. Your identity was given to you by something much bigger, something much greater. He comes and he finds you and he loves you and he puts worth on your life. The enemy is a liar. He wants to just lie to you over and over again. I see him lie to single people. I see him lie to married couples that love God. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny because you're single, you love God, you crave sex. You're married and you love God, you neglect sex. <laughs> Look at y'all trying to get religious. I'm telling you, this is not the service to come to. Being all like, I can't believe he's saying this. 
it's true, dude. Like, sex has a purpose in marriage. I mean, read the Bible. Like, sex has all sorts of purpose. It's for procreation. The first commandment given to Adam and Eve was be fruitful and multiply. Do you know how you multiply? You have sex. <laughs> it's not just for procreation. It's, it's for pleasure, thank God. <laughs> Turns out if you do it right, it feels good. No, nah, that ain't the truth. All right, get out of here, you know. The scripture also says it's for protection. Paul writes to the church in Corinth very, very clearly, and he speaks to married couples, and he actually commands them to keep having sex so they won't be tempted and fall away from one another. Sex is a bonding agent for a marriage. In fact, Paul goes as far to say, he says, the only time you shouldn't be having sex is if you're praying. So just be like, so what's up? We praying or something? What's up? I mean, <laughs> church on a fast again? What's up, man? Like, okay, it's good. Just, are we praying? All right. Paul actually says to us, to husbands and to wives, that, that your body is not your own, but rather it's, it's given to the other. That we're called to serve each other. We're not called to use one another, but we're called to serve each other. Listen, Dontre can't use me if I'm so busy serving her. You know, guys and girls are different. In fact, let me not say it that way because Don Tree eloquently already said it. It's not guys and girls. I'll just use, Don Tree and I are different. We're just different. You know, like, I'm just, I'm, I don't know. I'm a simple guy, you know? It's like, I don't know what the question is, but the answer is always sex, you know? So. <laughs> not now? Okay. <laughs> not a good time? Okay. Is, it, is now a good time? You're right, you're right, you're right. Let's pray, let's pray, let's pray. Let's pray. Let's pray. You can't get this kind of preaching at every church, man. You can't get... Who says that? Who says that? But Don Shree's different, you know? She's not as simple or not as mature as me. And... Um, and we've had to learn how to say, all right, let's go back to God's word, the designer. Listen to me, remove the boundary, you remove the beauty. We're not called to live in shame or hiding. We're called to go all the way back to the garden, naked and unashamed, transparent, real, honest. And God has put guardrails for our protection and to keep us. Choose life, choose God's plan. Oh, come on, we gotta put our hands together. That was so good. That was awesome. <laughs> Question number three, will you choose conflict instead of combat? This is an important question that every single one of us have to answer. There is a difference between conflict and combat. Uh, conflict is inevitable, combat is optional. There's a difference because there, there are disagreements that come in all of our lives. And when disagreements come, we have to choose to fight for us, not fight for me. There's a really big difference. What is the outcome? Do you just wanna be right? Or do you, just act, or do you actually wanna see this thing resolved? Do you wanna see peace found in your home? And you know, when I'm talking about conflict and combat, I'm actually talking about a mentality. I'm not talking about Physically. In fact, please don't let anything that we say today keep you in a physically abusive relationship. There is no excuse for it. There is no reason to stay in it. There's no season. There's no situation that makes it okay. Are you with me tonight? But conflict comes in every relationship. And conflict is actually healthy. 
Because conflict is the way that we grow. Conflict is the way that we learn how the other person sees and how we are able to find empathy and be able to see things differently. And if we really surrender conflict to God, honestly, we walk out better than we were before. Because like we talked two weeks ago, as iron sharpens iron, we sharpen one another. And, and conflict removes the rough edges off of us. It makes us more like Jesus. You see, conflict is a great teacher. Conflict is a great teacher, but you can't stay in the classroom all the time. If your relationship is consistently one conflict after another, maybe you're addicted to conflict. Maybe you're addicted to drama. Maybe you need to reframe what your relationship is actually about because all of us understand that conflict very easily escalates from the tone of your voice to the passive aggression that you bring to the table, so quickly it can escalate. And oftentimes it's us who are choosing to make the conflict escalate to a place that really isn't healthy. And again, Solomon talks to all of us about our relationships. He says in Proverbs chapter 15, verse 18, he says, a, a hot-tempered person stirs up conflict. That's a great picture. But the one who is patient calms a quarrel. How many arguments that we have were actually not inevitable, but we just kept stirring? Yeah, great. How often do we choose, instead of speaking peace, that we choose to stir the pot? Oh, I can hear it now. Oh, I'm just telling him the truth. Well, the way you're telling him the truth is actually stirring the pot. Yesterday morning, I got up with our kids and I was cooking Wyatt some breakfast and he loves toast. He always asks for toast. So I turned the oven on, I put it on broil, I put about four pieces of toast in the oven and I got distracted. And before I knew it, my brother was over and he said, what is that smell? And I said, oh my goodness. And I ran over and I grabbed the oven, and the oven door and I opened it up and you guys, the toast was on fire. It was not just burned, it was burned, burned, burned. <laughs> and I rushed outside and I threw it out on the ground and the fire alarm went off and Wyatt started to scream. And you know, as I looked at the toast, this is just a normal Saturday morning in our home. <laughs> this was no longer honey wheat toast, y'all. This was charcoal toast. Yeah. As I looked at the toast, I would never bring that toast in that was completely inedible and put it before my son and said, go ahead, eat up your toast. He wouldn't have been able to eat it, but you say, it's toast, but I'm not eating it. But you say, it's truth, but the way you're serving it, nobody can digest it. Nobody can receive it. Nobody can take it or understand it or wanna taste it. It's not good. How are you speaking the truth? How are you presenting your viewpoint that you are so proud of and that you are so assured of? Uh, I can tell you that if you wanna start a war, employ sarcasm. If you wanna employ a, a war, start to use the, that weapon of passive aggression. If you wanna start a war, hey, pump up the volume. Start to criticize. Start to ridicule, start to name call. I can tell you from experience, it doesn't work. All it does is, Rich? This is like the one message I can't say amen in, you know, like. I concur. Uh-huh, that's enough. <laughs> the truth is he knows. I, I've done all those things to him. And, and it never ends up the way that I, that I wanted it to because it didn't resolve anything. It just amplified everything. How, how do we learn to not amplify the, the situation that we're in to turn into us fighting against each other instead of fighting for one another? You see, I believe that the solution is what King Solomon said in his wisdom that was given to him straight from God himself. He said, patience actually calms a quarrel. Your patience can bring peace. 
Your ability to stop and to pause before you respond can actually take a storm and suddenly calm the waters like nothing else can. You don't even have to have the right words to say. You just have to stop for a moment, regain your composure, get a new perspective, and trust God with the situation. Come on, do I have a witness in the house tonight? We can employ patience. Patience is a weapon. Patience is powerful. Patience is not some beautiful flowery word. No, friend, it's a powerful weapon. It's a fruit of the Spirit, and it should be growing and evident in our lives. We should not rush into combat. We should wait. We should invite the Holy Spirit into the conversation of our hearts. When we don't know what to do, we shouldn't just reach for those old weapons of warfare, but we should say, God, you have a plan for this relationship. We committed before you that we would love each other all the days of our life. So Lord, let me know how to love best in this moment. Give me the words that I need. Give me the wisdom that I need. Let me place myself in his shoes to see what he says. God, give me grace right now. And as you are patient, as you lean into the Holy Spirit, who is my counselor and who is your counselor, you don't have to fight alone, friend. You've got one who fights your battles for you. You have one who goes before you, who knows exactly what you need and seek. And if you open up your heart to him and if you wait on him, he will fight your battles. He will fight this war and he will bring peace and he will make us better. He will make us better for it. That is the beauty of patience. Patience is powerful. Don't stir the pot. Choose patience. Choose to wait on God. Choose to take a moment back. Just like Rich said that there are guardrails in your sex life. How many of you know that there's guardrails to fair fighting? There is a way to fight. Fighting is healthy. You grow from disagreements. But there are just some things that we got to get off the table. Yeah, your tone matters. But we also can't assassinate each other's character. We can't call each other names. We, we can't resurrect the past. Listen, if you laid it to rest, if you've already worked through it, please don't bring it back. Please don't throw it back in the person that you love's face doesn't solve anything. If you need to take a moment to regain your composure and to think through what you actually want to say so you don't say something that you regret, then take a moment. Take a moment and then come back to the table and talk about it. How about say an apology? We can't be afraid to say we're sorry and we have to be graceful as we accept apologies. We actually have to learn how to do it the right way. We trigger each other over and over again. So oftentimes we can lose the plot of what the conversation is actually about. Can we talk about that for a minute? That somebody says something they didn't mean to say and all of a sudden the fight becomes about that instead of what you actually need to solve. Give the grace to allow someone to pause, retract their words and say what they actually wanted to say so that you can resolve it. These are just some of the guardrails that we have in relationships and we don't always get it right, but friend, conflict is not your enemy. Conflict can make you better. Conflict can make you more united. Conflict can bring you together. Sometimes like nothing else can, so you can work through the things that have been holding you back. But don't let it escalate into combat. Many of us have to grow and learn these rules, rules of engagement, because the way that we've watched combat in our home growing up, well, it was unhealthy and it was dangerous. Maybe you grew up in a home that avoided conflict at all costs, that things weren't talked about, that things weren't handled. That's not God's plan for you. Or maybe you grew up in a home where the volume was at the top notch and the names were spoken and the past was consistently dug up. Friend, that doesn't have to be God's plan for your relationship. You are a new creation because of the love of Jesus. The legacy that you can leave can be one of hope and healing and forgiveness and grace. Please, let's not be like gladiators in a coliseum, fight to the death. 
Instead, let's commit because of the love of Jesus Christ that we can fight to the life, that we can fight until it's resolved. We can fight until there's healing. We can fight until there's clarity. Oh, come on, do you see it today? Do you see a new vision for the way your relationship can be? The question is, will you choose? Will you choose to embrace conflict and to reject combat? It's beautiful. I've learned that when it comes to conflict, one of the most basic things you can get good at is simply saying, I'm sorry, will you forgive me? The quicker you can do that, the quicker your heart is open for restoration. And even in this room right now, some of you are just one, I'm sorry away from finding your relationships being restored. Just get good at it. I'm sorry, will you forgive me? I love fighting with you. We get better. Rules of engagement, it's beautiful. Questions that every couple should ask. Choosing life. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna listen before I speak. I'm gonna consult the designer about this thing called sex. I know there's gonna be conflict because as iron sharpens iron, so one man, so one woman sharpens another. But we don't have to enter into combat. And lastly, here's the last question I want you to write down. Will you choose to like them as much as you love them? Sounds simple, but I think it's really powerful. Um, you know, I was really kind of raised here my high school years in uh, Dade County, which means I was, I was raised on hip-hop. Y'all, hip-hop raised me. Don't judge. But when I moved to college in Cleveland, Tennessee, uh, I was indoctrinated with country music. Hallelujah. <laughs> country raised me. <laughs> I'm a country kid now, and um, there's this, this songwriter and musician, his name's George Strait. I really like his music. That is too funny to me that somebody uh, all the way here at the iTech Auditorium in Little Haiti in Miami is shouting for George Strait. God bless him. His influence, it, it, is, it is spread. It is beautiful. He had this beautiful song. I liked it a lot when I heard it in college, and it says, I know that she still loves me, but I don't think she likes me anymore. And it always stuck with me because I think there's something to that, that there's a big difference between love and like. I believe that love is the greatest power in the universe, but love is a choice and love is a commitment. Like is a natural feeling. It's an enjoyment of someone else. And I just don't want the relationships at Voo Church to simply survive. I want to see the relationships at Voo Church thrive that you're not just called to get by. You're not just called to kind of go from one piece of drama to the next piece of drama, from one fight to the next fight. No, you can actually like that person that you've decided to partner with. You can actually enjoy that person. You can get back to laughing at what you used to laugh at, making jokes, having fun. It's so very important. What happens is the longer we're in a relationship, sometimes we can begin to accentuate all the bad in that person. But a wise person, a healthy person, doesn't accentuate the bad. They focus on the good. Whenever I sit down with people for couple counseling, my first question is always this. Do you want to have a good relationship or do you want to have a great relationship? And maybe it sounds like semantics to you, but it's so much more than semantics. It's the intention of the heart. Because when I got married to my wife 13 years ago and we exchanged our vows I made a decision that day. Yes, I was going to fulfill my vows. And yes, I was going to love Don Shree. But I made another decision. I said, I'm not just going to have a good marriage. I'm going to fight to have a great marriage. I'm not just going to be in love. I'm going to be in like. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Maybe you're saying, well, what's the key to keeping the like effect happening? I think it's simple. I think it's this word gratitude. I think gratitude is one of the most powerful tools that God gives us. But when it comes to gratitude, we must speak it out. People sometimes say, well, no, my partner, they know how I feel. They know my heart. No, they don't know your heart. The only way they know their heart, your heart is if you, if you say it. That's why the scripture says, out of the heart, the mouth will speak. I would even suggest that if you're not saying it, I'm questioning what's in your heart. Because if it's in your heart, it comes out of your mouth. And the things you appreciate, they get better. The things you depreciate, they get worse. And if you want your relationship to get better, you should start appreciating your partner. You should start getting grateful for your partner. You ought to say it. You ought to show it. You ought to write it. You ought to text it. Do anything. Just don't suppress it. Don't hide it. 
Because every time you hide it, you're taking a step back. You might still love them. But I wonder, do you like them anymore? Is that joy that you once had, is it, has it gone away? I believe it's when we get grateful, we always get joyful. And it's the joy of the Lord, which is our strength. And it's the joy of your relationship, which will be your strength. God wants your relationship to thrive, but you have to choose life. You have to choose gratitude. You have to choose to say, I'm not just gonna love them, I'm gonna like them also. Yeah, I love our relationship collections. I'm so glad that you're here, and I'm so glad that those of you that are watching by way of YouTube or on the podcast, I love talking relationships. I think it's really important. The Bible says a lot about it. Yet I always have a conflict as a pastor because we only get so many Sundays out of the year. And there's a whole lot of resources out there in the world that you could go if you want to get serious about bettering your relationship. There's counselors, and there's great books, and there's great seminars, and I would suggest you do all of those things. So sometimes there's a conflict inside of me because we only get so much time together. And I don't want to just spend all of our time together sharing principles. I want to spend our time together sharing about a person. That person has a name. His name is Jesus. And the reason why I get excited about talking about Jesus to you is because Jesus is the greatest relationship in your life. Until he becomes first in order, your life will always be out of order. Until he becomes the priority, the first of your life, every other area of your life will have negative effects. See, I've actually learned that when you actually fall more in love with Jesus, you become a better partner. When you fall more in love with Jesus, you become a better husband, a better wife. When you fall more in love with Jesus, you become a better friend. You become a better son, a better daughter, a better father, a better mother. Why? Because when you get your vertical relationship with God right, it spills into all of your horizontal relationships. And tonight, I don't know what you've walked in here with. I don't know what you're carrying. This subject matter is always sensitive. There's people that are already offended. There's people that have questions. There's people that are upset. There's people that feel convicted. There's people that feel guilt and shame. While none of those are the intention of the message, Sometimes God's word, it can do that to us. And I want to encourage you about this person named Jesus. Because most of us have probably heard the phrase, Jesus loves you. And that is so true and that is so beautiful. But can I maybe take it a step back? <laughs> Jesus doesn't just love you. Step back. Jesus likes you. I don't know, I feel like maybe you came here and I, that's the only thing you needed to hear. What? What do you, I know, I know he loves me. No, he loves you, but he likes you. You know, when I, when I met Don Shree, a lot of times I talk about the fact that I, I, it was love at first sight. I'm not sure if it was. What I certainly know is that it was like at first sight. I enjoyed this girl. She made me laugh. I tend to think I made her laugh. But there was chemistry. Listen to me, Jesus has chemistry with you. Jesus likes you. Maybe that's hard for you to believe because you've been running so long, you've been hiding so long, you're carrying guilt and shame. You're saying, how could he like me? I don't even like myself. But I want you to know, he doesn't just tolerate you. He celebrates you. He invites you into a vibrant relationship. <laughs> Zephaniah chapter three, verse 17. This is an Old Testament book, a minor prophet. He says it this way. He says, the Lord God is in your midst. Oh, I love that verse. Because some of you, you're gonna get in your minivan tonight, you're gonna stop by the fast food, or you're gonna stop by a restaurant, you're gonna go home. I want you to know, Jesus is getting in that minivan with you. You don't have to wait till next Sunday night at 7.15 to come and be in God's midst. He goes with you everywhere that you go. He's at that job you're not really loving. He goes with you into those mistakes that you're gonna make, to the areas that you're gonna fall. He, he goes with you everywhere. And it says, a mighty one who will save. Jesus doesn't just wanna save your soul, he wants to save your relationship. He wants to save you from guilt. He wants to save you from shame. He wants to save you from hurt. He wants to save you from pain. He wants to save you from agony. It's who he is. A relationship with him saves us. 
And it says, he will rejoice over you with gladness. He's laughing, he's celebrating, and he will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. Many times we think about us singing to God. Did you know that God sings over you? How dope is that song? God singing over us. I tend to only sing over people I like. God, he loves you, but he also likes you. And the good news is tonight the choice is yours. I set before you life and death. Yes, there's a place called heaven, but you could bring heaven down to earth if you'll choose life. You say, but Rich, didn't Adam and Eve, didn't they break that boundary? Weren't they kicked out of the Garden of Eden? Yes, that's true. But the good news is, is that 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ, he died on a cross for your sins and for my sins. And when he declared it is finished, they opened the gates of Eden back up and said, all are welcome. I thought you had to be perfect to be in Eden. You do. But you're not going into Eden based upon your merit. You're walking into Eden saying, I know the owner of this place. His name is Jesus Christ, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. His blood covers my sin and my shame. I'm choosing life tonight. Come on, is there anybody out there who wants to choose life? Is there anybody out there who wants to stand up and declare, tonight I'm going God's way. Tonight I'm putting my trust, I'm putting my faith in the Waymaker. Come on, there's a God. His name is Waymaker. Come on, 